Hey guys, I am super excited to introduce you to Elizabeth Harrison Tilstra. She is a former professional ballet dancer who is now an orthopedic physical therapist. And I think we can all just take a second and give a round of applause that there is actual former professional dancers who are now becoming physical therapists and doctors who know what dancers' needs are. So Elizabeth, welcome to the show and I thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you for having me. This is really fun. I'm excited. So let's go ahead and before we get into how you are serving the dance world today, let's dial it back to the beginning for baby Elizabeth and let's just talk about how you got into ballet and how your ballet journey started. Um, yes. So my mom was a professional ballet dancer. Um, she danced with Cincinnati Ballet. Um, and so I would say that she was part of what um, brought me to dance. I, you know, I took creative movement classes when I was like three or four where you, you know, wave the scarf around and you make shapes and you jump on, you know, dots on the floor. Um, but and I love that. But it wasn't until I was around seven that my mom asked me to do like ballet class, and I originally did not. But I don't really have an interest. Um, and my mom was kind of like, "Okay, well, do you want to go watch a ballet class?" Like, you know, trying to encourage me a little bit. So we went and watched and observed, and and I remember kind of being like, "All right, fine." <laughs> Um, and then, I mean, I guess I loved it. <laughs> um, yeah. and my mom never really pushed me to date. I mean, she encouraged me that one time. Mm -hmm. And then from then on, it was definitely me that was, um, I, I was, I was progressing myself through the phases. And there were times where my mom would even say, Elizabeth, um, I, you're doing this for you, right? You're not doing this for me because you can quit anytime you want as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, there were times where I got really st stressed with school and dance and, and in those times my mom would say, you can quit anytime you want. And I've, no, I can't quit, you know. Um, so I would say it was my mom that introduced me to ballet, um, but I very quickly just fell in love with it. Um, and then continued on. It, it went from kind of a being, being an after school recreational activity to being something I was very, um, I was putting a lot of time and effort into many hours after school, um, some during school, because I, I went to a performing arts, um, fine arts magnet school for, for middle school and high school. Um, so that allowed me the opportunity to, to dance at school as well, mm. um, which was amazing. Um, and then even my senior year of high school, I was given the opportunity to perform Sugar Plum um, in the Nutcracker outside of, in the, at the ballet school in my city. Um, and I actually rehearsed that with the professional company um, during the day. And I was able to leave school during the dance classes at school to oh, wow. rehearse, um, you know, the pas de deux with a professional company member. Um, and then go back to school for the rest of my classes. So um, it was it was a really amazing opportunity that I had both in school and outside of school to train, um, which I'm grateful for. And then yeah. and then kind of and then I left home and went to college and and started kind of the professional dance world as well. Um, should I go? Yeah, so that is, that is amazing. I think that's such an awesome opportunity for you to be able to have worked with professional dancers, partnered professionally, all without the pressure of having a contract and, and making your money that way. Um, so yes, please do tell us. So at the end of high school, you've already had some of that professional performing and rehearsing experience, and then you're deciding what to do next. Did you know as you were finishing high school that you wanted to be a professional dancer? I did, but I knew that it was also, it was also important to me to get a degree. So I think that 
I didn't know when I would do either. If I would get a degree first and then dance professionally, or if I would dance professionally first and then get a degree. So um, I just applied for, for both. I, I applied for University of Cincinnati's College Conservatory of Music dance program, um, as well as SMU's dance program and IU's dance program. And then I also auditioned for companies and um, kind of looked at what opportunities were presented to me, who accepted me, and um, and I ended up getting offered a traineeship with Cincinnati Ballet. Oh, wow, yeah. Um, and so, you know, having the, the university in Cincinnati accept me into the dance program and the, the professional company in Cincinnati, um, I was able to, um, I asked both entities if I could do both. And the, the artistic director, Victoria Morgan at Cincinnati Ballet, um, and the, the director at the time at the university um, talked to each other and they worked out a way that I could do both. So I was able to get college credits um, by dancing with the professional company in town and rehearsing with the professional company. It kind of um, replaced the dance classes I would be taking at the university. Um, and then I was able to perform with both entities, which was really amazing because I was I had the amazing opportunity to do, to do some more principal roles at the university. Um, and, you know, Serenade and some, a William Forsyth ballet wow. and a, at Firebird, there were some amazing opportunities I got at the university as, um, as a soloist, as a principal. Um, and at the professional company, I was in the core. Um, I was doing Swan Lake and nut, I mean, Nutcracker, Snow and Flowers. Um, so I had both, um, it was good for me as a freshman in college to get that corps de ballet experience and really be put in my place, <laughs> looking up to those professional ballet dancers who were beautiful and amazing and really learning from them, but also having the opportunity in the university to do some, um, some difficult roles. Um, yeah, I think that's really amazing. I think that that idea of being able to do the core, which is so important and kind of just seeing the way that a company works and how the performances and the rehearsal schedule is while being able to continue to, you know, be supported and, and be put in those roles that really challenge you. That is really amazing. And, and I think like around the time that you were doing that, that was kind of more of a new thing, right? Because we're seeing more and more these opportunities being presented for dancers to get their education while they are dancing. But I know pretty much right before we were getting to that professional level, it was always more of a choice, right? Yeah, choose. Right, yeah. So I think that that's such a great example of how it can be really supportive of the dancer's journey. So how did you then get from Cincinnati to Joffrey, which is where I met you? Yeah. Um, so I did two years at the university and then decided that I didn't necessarily want to prioritize getting a degree in dance. I just wanted to dance. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew I wanted to to get a degree eventually. I just didn't know what I wanted it to be in yet. Um, so I fortunately was able, I, I was able to focus on core prerequisite classes or not prerequisite, gen ed classes, those first two years of college, um, knowing that those would easily transfer to another university, another degree. Um, and I'm grateful that I did that. Um, but I, I decided I wanted to try to, you know, dance professionally. Um, you know, the, actually the Joffrey opportunity happened while I was still in school. Um, Adam Sklute, the he was the associate artistic director of Joffrey Ballet at that time. He actually came down and taught a master class at the university. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, and I was actually performing the William Forsyth uh, New Sleep Pas de Deux, 
um, when he was in town. So he saw that dress rehearsal or performance or something. And he invited me up to come take class at the company because they were looking for dancers um, to supplement their production of Cinderella, Frederick mm -hmm. Sebastian Cinderella. Um, and so I went up and took class and then they offered me that opportunity to, to dance with the company um, for that show. Um, and so I, I took it, yeah. um, which actually the university was wonderful. They gave me a professional leave of absence. So wow. I didn't, you know, I could kind of come back if I um, wanted to. And the, the university really worked with me because it was, you know, I was a dance major and this was a dancing opportunity. And so they understood that it was uh, something I needed to go do. Um, so I moved to um, Chicago for four months or so. Um, and rehearsed with the company and performed. And um, it was an incredible, incredible opportunity. I can't say enough about how wonderful working for that company was. Um, and the dancers were all very welcoming. Um, and so that kind of reinforced my decision to go into that world, mm -hmm. um, to leave the, the, what felt kind of safe environment of the university um, and, and venture into the professional dance world. And so after that, um, I had done auditions and that's when I uh, got a contract with Nashville Ballet, moved to Nashville, um, and then danced with Nashville Ballet for three seasons, um, prior to then transitioning out of the professional world and back into school. Cause at that point I did know what I wanted to do after dancing. Hmm. And so take us then to Nashville Ballet. Where along the way, along those three years, did you start to feel the pull to want to do something different? Um, that's a good question. You know, I think I always wanted to do something different. <laughs> um, not that I didn't want to be present in dancing and not that I wasn't enjoying dancing. Um, but I knew I would always, I would find something else. I, I knew I didn't want to dance forever. And I knew that this was kind of my plan A, I'm going to get this out of my system <laughs> and I'm, and then I want to do something different. And at the time I didn't even think it would be involved in dance. I thought it would be something very, very separate between my first and second season, I um, was having hip pain and I ended up having um, arthroscopic hip surgery. Um, and so that was kind of my, my first big injury. And I rehabbed back from that with um, dance medicine physical therapists here in town, actually at the clinic that I currently work for now. Um, so full circle. Yeah. Um, and I realized how crucial and how important that support was that I got from those physical therapists who understood dance. They, they had a background in dance. They mm. knew what I needed to get back to doing. Um, and that support was inspirational for me. And I kind of thought, you know, I, I could do this, like I could help dancers rehab and, um, you know, it's something I'm passionate about health, wellness, movement, the body, yeah. um, and I felt like it would be a pretty seamless transition into kind of the orthopedic physical therapy world because it's, it's movement analysis, you know, right. it's, and that was, that's, that's what dancing is. It's watching movement, picking up on the details, um, and, and analyzing movement and, and creating it in your own body. Physical therapy, I don't necessarily have to create someone else's movement in my own body, but I have to study their movement. I have to analyze it and I have to figure out the imbalances right. um, and how to correct them. And so right. it's a different kind of creativity. Um, so that was when it was with my own injuries in, in Nashville that I started playing with the idea of what's next. Um, I think I started also just becoming a bit more disenchanted with dance in general. <laughs> um, I found myself not doing it for myself anymore. It was more for other people mm -hmm. and I wasn't getting the fulfillment that I was getting before. Um, right. It just, things were evolving and changing, which 
which, you know, pushed me towards finding what was next. And right. I think I knew I didn't want to leave the world altogether, but I wanted it to be in a different capacity. Right. I think we talked about before, we talked a little bit about the politics that are involved in ballet and in company life that I think a lot of people who haven't ever experienced that are just unaware of. And it's, it's really, it's a disappointing factor just because of what ballet is and what it can be depending on those who are in charge. Absolutely. And it's such a, it's a creative, um, it's very, it's a vulnerable art form. It's, it's, you're giving a lot of yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you're kind of putting it all out there. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of times the decisions that are made aren't always based on what you're putting out there. You know, right. it's a, it's a business and right. the business has to stay alive. And, um, someone is responsible for keeping that business alive. And so they right. have to make decisions that are maybe outside of just the artistic component, yeah. um, which can be, which can be, um, jarring. Yeah. And it can be really discouraging, right? Because and I always try to tell my students who are pursuing the professional path, um, how important it is to be able to separate yourself from that role that you play as much as possible because it is so subjective, right? Whoever the artistic staff is, they have the right to do whatever they want and they can just follow their personal preference or they can follow someone else's personal preference or, you know, really it has nothing to do with you yeah. the, at the end of the day. But that's such a difficult thing for us as dancers to wrap our heads around because as you said, it's us that we're putting out there. Right. We're the product. I mean, sometimes it's that they, they're looking for someone with different hair color. Right. You know, Something as simple as that. that. I remember one of the dancers that was, I was dancing with at Joffrey Ballet. Um, she had red hair and I thought, well, surely she's always had red hair, but apparently like she told me that they asked her to dye her hair red. I know exactly who you're talking about. <laughs> and I was like, what? You what? know, that's, that's a thing. It's a thing. <laughs> yeah, that was, yes. Yeah. And then that, that artistic staff took that preference on to the next company they went on and, and, you know, it just affects, it, it affects everything. But knowing that I think is so important um, to be able to tell younger dancers, right? Because we do take it so personally because it is us and it's all our work and, and everything that we're putting out there. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. Let's just talk a little bit about that identity of being a dancer, right? We put so much of our life and time and money into the training and into pursuing that, that when you decide to start pursuing something else, can you take us a little bit through what that transition was like? So we had a little bit of sound trouble, but now we're back. and. So we were just talking about how important it is for a dancer to be able to kind of separate a little bit from their identity, from being that product, that dancer. So I would love to hear you talk about what it was like to go from being a dancer, all the time that we put into that, all of the identity that got wrapped up into that. And then when you transition to pursue something else, what is that journey like? It's hard. <laughs> That's yes. hard. It's very challenging. Right. <laughs> that yeah. is my first comment. Um, it was, it was harder than I thought it would be. I did not anticipate it being as difficult as it was, especially since I felt so ready to do something else. You know, I'm, I'm very ready to, to put my effort into plan B. Right. And I didn't realize how difficult it would be to just leave behind plan A because that was my first love and my first, you know, career and right. what I had been doing every day since I was seven years old. Right. Um, and so that transition was a long one, I would say. 
Um, so advice to someone else is like, give yourself time years. Like I, I still feel like I am transitioning. I still somewhat identify as a dancer. I think it's a, in a healthier way now right. than it was. Which I would say you are a dancer, right? Something that I say, I, I say once a dance for always a dance, right? I 100% agree. Because it's part of you. It is part of you. It's, yes. And I, I would also share that sentiment of giving yourself grace and just kind of exploring the feelings, right? Because there, I think there's so many feelings that can come up when someone is transitioning from that life of pursuing professional dance to pursuing anything else. Yeah, absolutely. Um, giving yourself grace. I love that. I think that's huge. Um, and you know, you, you start to learn new things about yourself too. Um, it was hard for me to not be a dancer anymore. You know, now I'm just a college student and that's not as impressive. Right. You know, when you, you, when you say I'm a professional ballet dancer, people are like, Whoa, I've never met one of those before. Right. And you're like, I'm a college student <laughs> at the age of 24, <laughs> you know, people are like, why are you still in college? Um, so it's, it's there, it, there's something missing there. There's like a, a void or something. And it's, it's trying to, I found myself trying to fill that with other things. Who am I? I only mourned the loss of, of my dancer self or maybe my dancer career. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I mourned it right away. It took me time to be yeah. actually understand what those feelings were and say, oh, this is me like grieving a right. lot. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's so important. Absolutely. That's a really important step because when something is such a big part of your life, and especially for those of those of you who have been dancing your whole lives, right? Um, I think they're along the way, there becomes a lot of expectations of exactly how life should look. And so for mm -hmm. anyone who's dealing with those kinds of um, changes in their life, it's important. That word grieving, I think, is so important to use because sometimes the feelings can feel so heavy that you almost feel like something's wrong. Yeah. But it's not wrong. Or like you're letting people down. Mm -hmm. um, I think I felt, because you get that reaction when you say, well, I'm, I'm going back to school, I'm stopping dancing people and they're being supportive, but they're like, Oh no, you know, right. What a waste or, right. but you're so talented. Right. And again, they're being supportive, but you know, that it's, it's hard to hear because you feel like you're disappointing them in some way, right. you're disappointing yourself mm -hmm. that if you were a better dancer, you would still be dancing. Right. Um, yeah. And, and I think it's, it's important. I think that's why having your identity wrapped up in dancing can be, um, can be detrimental. Right. Yeah. You don't know how to defend yourself outside of being a dancer. Like, mm -hmm. you know, yes. Well, thank you. I appreciate you saying that it's a loss to the dance world that I'm not dancing anymore, but I'm, I'm truly ready to move on. Right. And yeah. being okay with saying that, not apologetic. Right. Um, because think, nobody needs to apologize for deciding right. to do something else. To do something else. I, I remember writing that down probably like only three or four years ago. So it was a while after I had left professional ballet, but I like wrote down on, in, on a paper, it's okay to choose something else. Yes, because I really wanted to communicate that message that I was just learning to other dancers because I do think that there's kind of this thing that gets perpetuated that dancers who choose to do something else, or even if they don't choose to pursue professional dance in the first place, is that they're giving up, right? Yeah. And that right. is really damaging, I think, because that's the furthest thing from the truth. I just really want to highlight how your ballet training has helped you and influenced the rest of your life and your career that you've chosen. Um, it, I, 
it has helped me in so many ways and I am so grateful for um, all that dance gave me. Um, even, and, and, I, and I can't even say, you know, that professional dance gave me, it's, it's right. just dance training in general. Um, I think it gave me um, the discipline. I, I think that I am, I am su successful in other aspects of my life outside of dance because I learned how to give myself to something and really dedicate myself to something. Um, maybe sometimes too much, <laughs> um, but I, you know, I think that a lot of the skills that I learned in dance, like having to work hard for something, you know, ballet is hard, dance is hard, and it did not come naturally to me like it does to a lot of people. I really had to work for it, and um, and, and that is a great lesson, you know, yeah. to be okay with pursuing right. things that are difficult instead of giving up when things are challenging. Um, and, and, and professionally, I mean, with what I do as a physical therapist now, I mean, being a dancer absolutely set me up for being yeah. successful in this career, just with the, the body awareness, movement analysis, um, understanding of the, having a kinesthetic sense, understanding of kinesiology. Um, I was taking kinesiology type classes as a dance major prior to physical therapy school. And, you know, there's a lot of techniques, like we did Alexander technique in school and I learned about somatics and all of these things that if I had mentioned Alexander technique and somatics to my PT class, they'd have been like, what the heck is that? You know? <laughs> um, so there, there's a, there, I, I, I absolutely disagree that to, for it to be worth the time and effort, you have to go professional or right. you have to put so many hours in a day. You can dance for fun. You can dance one day a week. You can do it because you enjoy it. You can right. do it because you want to exercise. You can right. do, you don't have to, you know, a lot of high schoolers, I think I, I start to see, well, I don't know if I'm going to do this in college, I don't know if I'm gonna do this professionally, so what's the point? Right. You know, if you're not enjoying it anymore, then stop. Right. But if you still love it, mm -hmm. it's okay to do, mm -hmm. even if you're not gonna to gonna be a professional. And I think that's something that we have created in the dance world, this mm -hmm. idea of you have to decide, you have to make a decision and you either do it and go professional and like give it all you got or like get out of here. Right. Yeah. Right. And I think that's so detrimental yeah. to the dance world and to the dancers. I, I'm always telling people over and over again now that ballet training is never a waste. Um, it, you can, you can get only benefits from ballet training if you are approaching it in the best way. And so let's talk a little bit about that, um, about that having to choose, right? Because we talked prior about just kind of ways that maybe the dance world is, specifically the ballet world is stuck in a certain idea of what produces results mm -hmm. for ballet dancers. And now as we know more about the body, you're a physical therapist, you've done all the training, you have a little bit of a different perspective on what could be more beneficial for dancers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that their um, ballet is very tradition-based. Um, I mean, it's, it's hundreds of years old. You know, it comes, we, we have, we can look back at dance history and see the evolution of ballet. Um, but we can also see that um, we have had very little evolution in how we're training the dancers um, over the past hundred or so years. Um, yet what we're putting on the stage and the results you know, the, the art that we're putting out there has evolved tremendously, right? You know, classical ballet, um, used to be, you know, very like low arms, low legs, walking around on tiptoes, po posing, right? Yeah. I'm trying to like get in the camera and pose. <laughs> um, 
And now it's how high can you get your leg? You know, right. how, you know, yeah. much can your back extend and compress? Yeah. Um, how high can you jump? How many turns can you do? Right. Um, and that's just classical ballet, right? <laughs> and, then, and then there's contemporary ballet <laughs> where choreographers are creating these amazing works right. that are just incredibly athletic. Right. Um, and we're, we expect the dancers to be able to, to do these works, yet our training for them is ballet class, right? right? We give them ballet class in the morning, and then we start rehearsals right. um, in the professional world. Right. And ballet class has not evolved very much in a long time. We actually have scientific research that shows that what we do with our mechanically physiologically is very different than what we do in center. So yeah. are we really setting ourselves up for center? There's, yeah. there's kind of, I, I'm not against the bar. I am all about the bar, yeah. but I think that we have to understand what bar is doing for us. Yeah. Um, you know, ballet class, is not strength training. Mm. It, it's, right. um, you can I'm get stronger. <laughs> no, yeah, no, you, you can get stronger from it. Mm -hmm. but it is not strength training. Mm -hmm. um, it's not cardio. There's, there's no part of class that is cardio. I mean, even if you're running every with, you know, doing every combination with every group, I yeah. mean, you, you'll, you can probably get your heart rate up, but that's difficult to do. And right. there are groups for a reason because there's a lot of people in the studio. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, the cardio training is not there. Um, and our pre-professionals, um, Typically what is prioritized is ballet class, um, point variations, maybe modern or contemporary of some sort. Um, we are starting to see some cross training classes becoming more prevalent, which I think is yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Um, and I think that that is because dance medicine is becoming more of a thing and we're realizing like we do need to train our dancers more. Um, I have some concerns with who's teaching those cross training classes. I think a lot of times it's ballet teachers right. um, and ballet teachers um, might not be the best person to teach a cross training class um, because, you know, there's, there's a lot involved in creating a well-balanced cross training program and really knowing how to prepare the, the body. Um, and sometimes ballet teachers are not the best person. Well, right. To because, a lot of ballet um, kind of just gets passed down, right? From teacher to student, they might dance professionally, maybe not, and then they become a teacher. And so a lot of, like, there are systems to train ballet teachers, but a lot of ballet teachers have just been trained by previous teachers. And I would say, I know of experience and even done in the past where ballet teachers do cross training in a way where they're just really trying to get that same ballet aesthetic in different exercises. And like what they have they have different goals than I have as a physical therapist. My goal is to train the joint, train mm -hmm. the spine, train the hip to be strong, stable, well balanced. And my approach is gonna look very different than potentially a ballet dancer's approach which like you said, is maybe the goal is going to be different. It's going to be well, more and ballet based. Correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm really just, I'm just fascinated by the body. So I just do research on my own, but I would love to hear from you. What I'm coming to understand more, what I think I'm understanding is that, um, you know, in, in an effort to strengthen a certain area or get a certain look or whatever, it's not always about focusing on that specific area as much as it can be on the supporting things around. And I think a lot of ballet teachers don't know that <laughs> or just are focused on getting a specific result. And so then they miss where it could be coming from. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's, that's a great point. A lot of times people come to me with an injury in a certain body part and I give them exercises for a very different body part, you know, and they're kind of like, but you do know that <laughs> my injury is my knee. Right. Like, yes. But I think it's coming from 
you know, whatever your hip or your lack of stability in your core or right. ankle pronating all the time, internally rotating your tibia. So yeah, absolutely. There is not, um, the body is, is a whole being it's a, it's a machine and right. if one little part is off. It's going to start breaking down other places. Yeah. And the place that we have pain is not always the place of dysfunction. Right. Um, and I think that that might, I mean, that's the case in ballet sometimes too. The thing that you, maybe you're having trouble with, say, you know, you're having trouble with turns. Mm -hmm. I always had trouble with turns, mm -hmm. right? So I felt like I needed to do more, I don't know, more turns. <laughs> I needed yeah. to practice my turns more. Um, and, and what I probably needed to do was strengthen my glutes so that when I was in a passe position, my pelvis was in the right place mm -hmm. so that I could kind of sink my working hip and, you know, relax into that position so that I could sail around. Right. I actually needed to do, you know, core or glute exercises to help me with my pirouettes as opposed to just working on my pirouettes. Right. Yeah. I see that so often people are really, or a lot of students can get really obsessed with flexibility, um, specifically like markers like the splits or, you know, a 180 degree develop or something like that. And it's very difficult to convince them that stretching, 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 stretching isn't the way necessarily to get there. But Absolutely. a lot of times stability is needed for the mobility. Mm -hmm. So stretching and stretching and stretching is actually, um, yeah, weakening your muscles mm -hmm. and creating, um, uh, your nervous system is going to respond by the, to those weakened muscles and those overstretched muscles with a protective response that is going to tighten those muscles. Yeah. So a lot of times if we, we actually need more stability work in some cases, sometimes, you know, yeah, Sometimes the hypermobile the is tight and we need to stretch it. Sure. Oh, right. Um, but sometimes there is a stability issue and the muscles are actually tight because the joint is unstable mm. and doing strengthening exercises will actually create more motion in that joint. Right. We're often not stretching the right way. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. Right. Um, you know, when we stretch, we should be stretching muscles, not joints. And oftentimes the way dancers are stretching, they're stretching joint capsules out oh. and you don't want to stretch a joint capsule. You, I mean, some people need to stretch joint capsules, but the people that I actually stretch their capsule in PT, they're, they're like old tight men, you know, <laughs> like th that might have a tight enough joint capsule that we need to stretch it. Uh, yeah. Dancers typically <laughs> do not need that. Uh -huh. And if we are stretching something, we need to be stretching a muscle belly, mm. not at the attachment side of that muscle. So not at the back of the knee is where we should feel that hamstring stretch. We should feel it in the muscle belly. Um, Gosh, so high up in the leg then? So higher up in the leg, like in the mid part of the thigh. Like we all, we want to feel a stretch in the muscle belly, not at the attachment site where it attaches to the bone and not in the joint. We shouldn't feel it in the knee. Um, hmm. And so, you know, when we stretch our hip flexors, there are certain ways to do it where you're actually stretching the hip joint capsule and not actually the psoas. It's, it's a, you know, just what is the spine doing? Could be yeah. a difference like that. Right. And if you're stretching the hip joint capsule out and you're creating instability in that hip, you're promoting potential, you know, labral tears down the road or, right. you know, things like that. Right. Oh, I think this is so vital for dancers to hear, especially right now, because with everyone being at home, I know that there's kind of a collective fear of loss of ability, right? And sometimes that can translate to people overtraining or overstretching. And I just want to take this moment to encourage all the dancers out there in quarantine, please, please don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah, you could actually be doing more damage than good. And I, I'm sure Elizabeth can vouch as well as I. Technique comes back, strength comes back, all of those things come back. And um, during this time, I think it's just such a great time for people to pull back, right? A little bit from that training, since we really can't do it 
safely to the ability that we were able to in the studio um, and to use this time to maybe get to know their bodies a little bit better, maybe process some thoughts and feelings. <laughs> I love it. There's a lot of things that you could do, but just please don't over stretch or over train. It, yeah, with as much time you are putting into stretching, you should put, be putting just as much time into stability as well. Um, in fact, depending on your body type, more. You should be. Right. Mo most of the dancers that I end up treating, uh, they need to be doing more strengthening and more stability than they need to be doing stretching. And that's right. probably because they have been doing a lot of stretching. They're, they're already, already mobile. Kind of right. they're, they're mobile. We just now need to give them stability to control that mobility. And I very rarely give stretches to dancers. Mm, as no. treatment. Like I, I, I almost never do. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's a dynamic stretch or teaching oh, yeah. them how to stretch before class and, you know, mm -hmm. dynamic stretching. Mm -hmm. um, I just think static stretching, too much static stretching is detrimental and we do too much of that as right. dancers. Right, and wouldn't you say that for those strengthening and stability exercises that um, quality is greater than quantity, right? So we see also a lot of um, just repetition, more and more and more and more. And I'd love for you to speak a little bit on that efficiency aspect, that idea of really putting your intention and doing it properly fewer times. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think it comes down to really having an understanding of the anatomy and how the body works. And um, I think that comes with, you know, a lot of times we end up having to have an injury and go through rehab to really understand how the body works. And you know, that's the silver lining of having an injury. I always tell my dancers, I want you to know more about your body and be stronger, be able to dance more efficiently and better when you get back so that this was all a good experience for you instead of just a negative one. Right. Um, ideally, you don't have to have an injury to be able to learn that. Right. But um, understanding the anatomy and how and what muscles do what jobs, um, we there's such an there can be an ease in dancing that is not as obvious. Um, you know, I, I, dancers tend to pull everything up and in and activate everything that they possibly can. Like I'm squeezing my, my glutes and my abs and my quads and my everything that I can squeeze, I'm squeezing in this fifth position. Yeah. And or in this tondu. And I'm like, it's a freaking tondu. You know, <laughs> yes, tondu is hard if you're gonna present the heel forward and you're gonna maintain a neutral spine and there's a lot of components. Mm -hmm. But if you know what muscle group presents that heel, my hip external rotators, and I know exactly where they are, you know, mm -hmm. and what muscle maintains the spine in neutral, my transverse abdominis, and so I'm gonna keep that engaged. So maybe my glute can relax a little bit. Mm. Those do not, those aren't my external rotators. And maybe I can, you know, so it's finding, understanding where to put the emphasis and where to put the mental energy and okay. the, the physical energy as well. Um, and where to relax a bit because we tend to get into this, like everything I do, I'm gonna do it 100% with my entire body. Right. And that is exhausting and, right. and yeah. not efficient right. and not good for you. Right. Um, so I think, you know, and I think that a lot of that is verbiage and how we're teaching and how we're cueing, right? So yeah. I love some cues that, da that teachers use. And I think that other cues are really confusing, right? Especially it's been an interesting transition um, going from a dancer who, you know, I heard all these cues and they meant one thing to me then. Right. And now I, I'm a, I'm, I'm still a dancer, but I'm also, uh, uh, I have the knowledge of, you know, physical therapy. And so right. I'm looking at it from a different lens and I'm hearing these corrections with a different filter. Right. And I know what the teacher is trying to say, 
but anatomically it actually contraindicates what the body is doing. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> or, um, you know, or some cues that I think, what does that even mean? Like, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know, pulling up and in, stand in fifth and pull up and in. And mm -hmm. I, I like that cue in some ways, but that cue also to me makes me want to clench everything. Right, right, right. Yeah. Pull everything up and in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but what is that mean? definitely oh i know i i i remember when i started because i started later i was 14 and i remember for the longest time thinking i can't engage my abdominals without holding my breath i don't know what they mean yeah <laughs> well it's so that's what it turns into it turns into a clenched pelvic floor clenched mm -hmm. hip muscles clenched abdominals yeah. mm -hmm. and then we are not breathing well and oh my gosh that is like a kick that i am on right now dancer so many dancers do not know how to breathe right we have an an expansion of the rib cage with inhale and then collapsing down right. the yeah and oftentimes it's the opposite for dancers yeah. because they're such chest breathers because right. their transverse is so tight all the mm -hmm. time Right, or, yeah. You know, they're in a corset and they can't, oh, they can't breathe right. in the costume. So they're breathing up here, um, which creates back injuries, rib dysfunction, pelvic floor dysfunction, hip oh. problems. There's so many things that can come from that. Um, we're also finding that dancers tend to have really tight but weak pelvic floor muscles. Mm, yeah. That makes sense if you're taught to pull everything up and in all the time and clench down there all the time. There's oh certain times your pelvic floor should be engaged, but there's other times where it needs to be relaxed and it needs to actually drop and rise with breath. Ah. <laughs> it just gets more intuitive and that's, right. but that's also the, that's often the case a lot of times we think a tight muscle means we need to stretch it. Well, stretching can temporarily weaken the muscle. That mm -hmm. muscle might be tight because it's weak and the body knows it's weak. And so is telling it to stay tight to protect itself. Uh -huh. So it's tightness is often a protection mechanism mm -hmm. and needs to actually be strengthened. And by strengthening that muscle, you mm -hmm. actually have a relaxation of the muscle. So the pelvic floor is similar to that. If, if we are always contracted, then we are never, um, we don't have that relaxation and engagement and then, and we don't know how to engage it because we're always engaged. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Because then the muscle doesn't really have that movement that it needs to have. Right. Cause it's always, Absolutely. To stay. we should have a concentric and eccentric mm -hmm. contraction, a lengthening and a shortening of a muscle. Um, but if we're always, it's like doing a bicep curl and staying there all day long. You're not going to get a strong bicep by staying like right. this all day long. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that is where cross training is so important then, right? You have the, um, the exercises that can be targeted to specific weaknesses or tightness or, um, instabilities. And then you have breath work, yoga, Right, all of those things I'm a big proponent of. <laughs> yes. So, okay, great. This is fantastic. I think this is so great for everyone to hear. 